Let's give it a second here. Okay, uh, we are live. We'll just give it a second for people to come in here. Uh, and while we are waiting, I'll just do a quick intro. So hello, everyone, and welcome. Happy World Art Day. Uh, we're excited to be back for a special live Q&A discussion, uh, New Masters Academy, uh, with uh, New Masters Academy founder Joshua Jacobo and master artist and instructor Glenn Vilpu. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to mention that we are running a World Art Day promo and a giveaway raffle, uh, so all links and information can be found in the description below the video. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over to you both. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, really excited uh, to be doing this again. Uh, whose idea was the World Art thing to begin with? Because we did it one year before, and it like turned out to be way more impactful and, <laughs> than we thought it would be. And I think this year we're like, oh, we got to do it even bigger. But wh where did that come from? Caleb, do you know? I'm pretty sure it was all my idea. Yeah. And, and no one else was involved in that. Oh, yeah. No, that was funny. I thought it was my idea. <laughs> no, it's funny. But uh, I'm glad we're doing all these people, A lot of people on the team uh, came together to really pull that off. Um, yeah. And it was successful. And it was an amazing event. Everyone had a lot of fun. And we're looking forward to doing this on an annual basis. Um, and really just keeping up this uh, this celebration of artists every year. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really fantastic. It's fun to get to do these kinds of things because we're always doing live events and live classes and workshops and stuff, but it's with the new master's audience. It, I like that this is open for anybody so that if people are curious or they don't really know what new masters is about. This is like a free way that they can hopefully learn some useful things, but get inspired and you know, get art red pilled or whatever we want to call it, where you start realizing that it's much deeper and more interesting and beautiful and fascinating than maybe you thought being elsewhere on YouTube. <laughs> and so I think this is a good way to kind of hear something. If, if anything that you hear during today today's events uh, is makes you interested or curious, not only can you get involved with a promo, which is really good to get involved, but you could just come to the Discord too, which is free. And you can just come and poke around and lurk and ask questions. And you're going to realize that if you're not already part of New Masters Academy, you're missing out on, on really the best uh, art community in the world and the best resource. So no matter how you do it, there's free content, there's the subscriptions, but you should just really, if you're serious about your, your art and your craft and you really want to invest in yourself, you should, you should get involved with New Masters Academy as quickly as possible. That being said, uh, one of the original teachers that uh, really the really the the second collaborator of this big collaboration that we call New Masters Academy uh, is is our is our guest here today, uh, Glenn Vilpu. So welcome, welcome, Glenn. Well, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> you know, it's uh, you start talking about the evolution of what we've gone through with New Masters Academy, and I was talking with Peter a little bit and talking about how. Reminding me, well, we started out, remember, well, first it started out you sitting in my drawing class. <laughs> yeah. And then we're going from there, and we got the Vilpo Academy, and then we got uh, Joshua's going and down in your garage, and we start doing it first time with big sheets going over everything and uh, trying to block out the cars and the light. And what have, and it's been <laughs> an amazing evolution. It really has. Yeah, it's sort of like, that's what you, when you start a business, what you're hoping is that it's this garage to global thing. But unfortunately, most of the time it doesn't work out. So it's actually, it's only, you only hear the stories when it worked out because there's plenty of garage businesses that they didn't leave the garage. Well, <laughs> you know, it's the whole evolution. Okay, so I've been teaching for forever. You know, teach, I've been, Started teaching about 1961, so most of before most of your mothers were born, <laughs> and the evolution of being able to communicate to students, and that's that's really that's really the, the thing. Yeah, I know. I have always. I'm. I try to keep up on things. I'm. Some people think of as an old guy. I'm. I'm a little bit of a techie, you yeah. know. But be able to take and use this this uh, camera to be able to talk to people all over the world yeah. and to communicate and to demonstrate and to see that even if you're in a regular drawing class, 
all of the students can't see you critiquing yeah. each student. Yeah, yeah. Now everybody can see everything. They can yeah. ask questions. And if they can't see it at the moment, they can watch it later. Yeah. It, it's amazing, absolutely amazing, a bit of communication that we've got going. So yeah, and you you've been you've been pretty much you've used every teaching technology there is, from flyers to books to correspondence stuff to workshops. Can you talk a little bit? I'd be curious, this question is not on my list, but can you talk a little bit about the different ways you have taught and maybe what you learned from? some of those that'd be really interesting well of course i originally started out teaching with them you know you wear your arm out holding a book and trying to draw up on the wall <clears throat> that that was that was the big deal and you ended up creating a you know i have an incredible library because that was my resources <clears throat> yeah and then the xerox machine <laughs> I used to run down to because I kept doing the same. <laughs> I kept doing the same demonstrations over and over in a student's paper. I said, "Well, this is silly. Why don't I just take it in Xerox a drawing?" So I yeah. used to run down to the local liquor store to use their Xerox machines. <clears throat> then from that, it came to say, "Well, then I actually start printing a book. I probably nobody's ever even seen it." I did a series of small books, 12 pages, where I would have overlays. And so that was a huge thing, having overlays where you could show the thing. Yeah. And then finally, we started taking and moving into the cameras. Yeah. And, being, and it's been this sort of constant, constant, the idea of being able to draw on a computer. Yeah. I went through started out with the toshiba which was great yeah I went to surface pro and then i had um, um uh, what was it it's was called a geo it was a, it was a macbook but it was a mod book put on top of yeah they, it's, it's, it's a mod book i wanted those i couldn't afford them though they were like five grand i remember when those first came out i was like no way because yeah. i wanted to do zbrush on yeah, the go, yeah. I wanted to take ZBrush. I wanted to take ZBrush with me to figure classes, and then do that. But they were just a little too expensive. Yeah. For me to do. So then I, so when the, the the iPad came out, I thought, yeah, yeah, I, I can actually walk around with this thing. Yeah, and so I have, I do a lot of an awful lot of drawing on the iPad. Yeah, which is great because there's a it plays back immediately. Yeah. You can give all kinds of stuff. You can do a screenshot. You can, yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's just it's just it, the drawing has not changed. It, it, there are, I use exactly the same tools I did when I was a student in the nineteen fifties. Yeah, yeah, but that's interesting because students who grew up with digital, I know that we've talked about this before, but the students who grew up with digital since they don't have that traditional training underlying that they sometimes get into these habits where they you know are leaning on the software instead of leaning on their mental tool right. do you do you have any thoughts on that on like yeah i can't draw know, i i took and i did a um uh, i used to have a, a sheet that i would show the the was well, a vilpu checklist but there was two checklists. There's also from the, and I used to draw just the shapes of an icon that mm -hmm. the people said, you know, on the computer, if you don't use the software, it's not going to do anything. Yeah. Well, if you don't use the brainware, it's not going to do anything. Yeah. And it's, you have to, you have to understand the principles that take and create something. How do you make something round? Yeah. How do you work with the design? How do you make, how do you compose? But that, it's not the computer, mm -hmm. it's the brainware. Well, so now, yeah, things have changed a little bit with AI. That's now the current conversation that everybody is, it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. The, the computer where, where basically the, the, the artist, the artist types in what they want and then the computer scrapes 
tons of data from human artists and then generates an image. And the conversation has been, is that even art? Is it plagiarism? Is it creative? If you don't have the foundations, if you don't have any mastery, if you're just like, give me an image of this and you can describe it. Do you think that's, what do you think? What do you think about that? I'm curious about people who type a prompt and then get the AI image. It, you know, it, um, <clears throat> it's, you can take and it's a difference between, in a way, you can teach anybody, literally, and then I'm, <laughs> and I'm a particular, anybody how to play a piano. There's a difference between a piano player and a pianist. Yeah. And that's where you come in. You can mishmash all these things together. And you get up, you know, okay, it looks like something. Uh, but there's no art to it. Yeah. And the art is really, the definition of art really is the expression of man. And it's, okay, is that the end, the kind of expression that you want? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For me, it's not, you know, yeah. I, 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 and I'm still working on it. I'm trying to take and I want to take and be following like hook aside. By the time I'm 101, every line I put down will come to life. Okay. When, it's so, uh, it's so funny because I, I started studying with you. I don't even know, maybe 13 years ago, 14 years, something like that. And I had to do a demo today and then do this interview with you. So I was sweating it the whole time because I gotta, I gotta draw and then I don't know if my teacher's gonna see it or not. And nothing has changed. <laughs> Nothing's changed because I'm, I, I'm, I, I get much better every year, but so do you. It's extremely frustrating because you're this moving. I saw this drawing that you did for Friday figure drawing, which was the same model I just drew. It was Lao Kuan, which is what I've been teaching. And you, uh, oh, 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 here we, here we go. And you, uh, and you nailed it. It's one of the best drawings I've ever seen you do. And so you expect that people, you know, um, at some point start to wind down or slow down. But it seems with with Glenn, it's this. Uh, it's you're a true art master, like Michelangelo and the old masters. You just keep getting better until. I work that. Us. <laughs> it, it, the idea is, of course, is to get better. Yeah. And I'm constantly uh, on guard. To... <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you do a bad drawing. You know, yeah. I say, oh, damn, am I slipping? Is my old age coming in here? Yeah. I got to take and counteract that. I've got to take and be a little bit more sharper. I got to take and think a little bit more. Yeah. Same, same reason you do the sauna, same reason you exercise, same reason. I think this stuff keeps you keeps you young, keeps you healthy, keeps you sharp, and uh, that that's one thing that's really amazing about art is that we can truly just improve for our entire career. It's not like sports or uh, you know dance or martial arts or something. And it's you know it's one of the things that you know. Well, okay, in the last I was talking with Peter about how uh, the using a stone paper. Oh, this is great. <laughs> this is like a new, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. This stuff, right? You got one? <laughs> yeah, I love it too. It's funny. Uh, I think the honeymoon phase for a lot of people on the stone paper is over, but I, I still love it, man. I love drawing with graphite on this. Look, I'm just constantly filling, just filling this stuff with, with notes and I'm filling it with diagrams. And it, this is something that I learned from you that really you 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 always should be you're always working out your ideas you're always thinking you're always drawing that's something yeah. that i really picked up from you glenn is to always have a sketchbook and always be thinking and always be it's always be uh yeah, doing I've something got, i've got three sketchbooks i got a, uh, a i guess i what is it, four five I, a five or a six one of the little ones yeah yeah keep that in my pocket and then i've got the another one and then i've got the regular one and i've got now the large paper where, where did where did your sketchbooking habit come from because obviously we always we think of like leonardo da vinci he's probably the most iconic sketch sketchbook artist the way we think of it but did you get it from your teachers or when, where did you sort of pick that habit up uh, 
I went in school, we all, I have sketchbooks from 1955. Show them. Do you have them? You have them? You have them? You should show them, dude. Yeah. And that was the walkie when I was in high school. Well, I was taking Saturday classes with artists, uh, yeah. you know, I'm from the you know, Schnards and Art Center, and I was taking these Saturday classes. Well, we, the, the teachers would tell you, okay, uh, if you want to get into school full time, that's part of your portfolio is your sketchbook. So even even when you were in high school, that was the recommendation that you were getting from your teachers, like yeah. You, yeah. So did yeah. you see it? Did you did you because? Um, like Steve Houston is a good example of this, um, where his sketchbooks are like, there's they're like illustrations in the sketchbook and the spreads are sort of planned and it's sort of like a sketchbook, but it also is like the final media in a way. So it's like a show book or something like that. Do you think of your sketchbooks that way or are they more like whatever you need for them? Are you, are you thinking of them as showing, are you thinking of them as a final art form or are you thinking uh, of it as just a working term? Uh, no, it's just they're okay. Subway drawings. Uh, oh wow! Are, you must have studied with Devin Rodriguez. I'm kidding. Yeah. So these are. Uh, I I take in what I do. No, you have to be honest with that, because I do consider that people are going to look at my sketchbook. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm drawing everything. Yeah. Well, let me just really quick here grab. Looks like there's like a little sculpture in the background. Is that the Rajiv? <laughs> yeah. Hold on, Glenn. Is that is that from Santa Fe behind you? Is that? Yeah, the... yeah. We've got all that stuff. Are you guys still working on it, or did it get abandoned? Well, it, no. We've got the uh, the Jervis, We've got the other one, and Elmer keeps coming by and. Picking at it. She's tell so tell her if she's she, playing with it. If she wants to text me pictures, I can I can give her feedback on that. That's yeah. cool that she's doing it. Well, she hasn't gotten. We've been so busy, but okay. Yeah. These are sketch. This is sketchbooks, literally from drawings from uh, yesterday. Okay, now this is just as you can see. It's just family sitting around the kids, my grandchildren. Uh, uh, like that drawing and then there's uh, on the next page was part of the same thing okay here i was doing both mm -hmm. i was studying and i was taking and drawing my granddaughter uh with the cats do, do you think about people looking at your sketchbooks in the future when you're gone and re-experiencing what you experienced in a way that is much more real than a photo, much more profound. Do you see it as a way of like connecting with the future? Or do you think about that at all? Because you yeah. can imagine your great grandchildren, or your great great grandchildren, or some museum, I can see them having your sketchbooks on display someday and people looking at it and trying to imagine what you must have been thinking when you went through it. Yeah, it's, uh, I've always mentioned when you meet somebody, you don't know me until you see my drawings. And it really is, it is an evolutionary thing. Mm -hmm. You can see the compositional sketches in there. You can see the whole thinking process. Uh, the drawings, the drawings are the personal elements. And that's, that's to me, my art is uh, either two, two parts. One is the drawing and the other is I'm a teacher. Yeah. And my ability to take and to communicate the drawing and how to draw. And I think that's probably the biggest uh, thing I have for future generations is that I had uh, an ability to take and organize how you communicate the process. Well, you, you basically, it's almost like you taught the world because you had so many students, tens of thousands, over 100,000, I think we were calculating, more impact than Bridgman, more impact than so many artists. And since the 90s, the Vilpu Drawing Manual has been the gold standard for gesture drawing for everybody, you know what I mean? And you were colleagues with, you know, Glenn Keane and all, and all these uh, Disney animators, but even well before that, you were 
studying with the best art teachers in the world, in my opinion, people like Harry Carmian and, and Lorser and your other teachers were some of the best art teachers in the world. And so it, it's interesting that you talk about your drawings are serving a pedagogical purpose because they're, they're yep. there to be clear, but it's also your art. But if you think about the old masters, they always had apprentices, they always had a workshop and they were always involved with training because that was part of the job. Maybe that is something that you have in common with a lot of the masters of the past that you are a leader, a business person, a teacher, a, a mentor, a mentee when you were young and the artist making the work. It's sort of all of it together. Maybe this is just the modern version of, of that. What do you think? I know. I, I, I really do believe. <clears throat> and one of the things that uh, I think you've tried to do and uh, I do is to take and be able to take and communicate what the artists of the past were actually doing. Yeah. <laughs> And so in that way, we combining, combining, we're doing it ourselves. Yeah. But we're taking and bringing from the past a lot of this information that people today, they don't have time. They don't not, they're not getting it in their regular schools. <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not getting this information. They're not getting it on YouTube or online either outside of NMA, really. I mean, very rare, very rare. People basically... I mean, they just know almost nothing about art history until they're introduced to it. And once yeah. they once they are introduced to, like when I show students like Albrecht Durer's like wing, uh, uh, the drawing he did of a wing, it's like it blows their mind. But it's like, why am I the one showing you this? Why aren't you getting this in first grade in school? It's like I'm I'm preparing a lecture for tomorrow. I'm going to give, and it has to do with, okay, I'm combining in one in one an hour and a half. So Thomas Hart Benton, oh, yeah. Tinoretto, <laughs> and Al Greco, and to show they're all doing the same thing. Yeah. It just has a different period look to it, yeah. but the fundamentals are exactly the same. Yeah, the fundamentals are the same, but as you go back in art history, I find that you get more clarity on what those fundamentals actually are. And then you realize that that diagram that you saw Bridgman do that you loved is really a copy from a drawing manual that's a copy from a drawing manual that's a copy from Leonardo. And then when you actually go to Leonardo and you compare Leonardo to Bridgman, you're like, this guy was drunk when he did this drawing. But it's weird because you're right. You're right. The, the teachers, because it's a tradition, the teachers were kind of, we have an unfair advantage because I can say, bullshit, 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 something from Leonardo, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And because the students haven't heard the Leonardo thing, they're like, Joshua's a genius. So I find that that happens a lot where the, the, the nuggets that are common between all the best teachers, those all have an art historical root. Yeah. The actual contributions of really us are very true. modest compared to that tradition. Do you feel like that? Yeah, I, I, and this is something I say. It's not new. Yeah. Nothing I teach is new. Yeah. I, I combine things. I put them together in a little different way, and I, and I present them as from me. But it's not new. Yeah. Absolutely not new. And you can apply this stuff. I'm doing this stuff. Like I'm doing these Renaissance drawings on the iPad. Okay, and I'm taking. Insane. You would think if anybody here works at Apple or knows anybody at Apple, Glenn's the most skilled master using your products. You guys should be doing something with Glenn Vilpu. So if anyone here knows anybody at Apple, uh, Glenn's the real deal, and nobody nobody can touch him. He's he's yeah. he's like a living old master, and he's using your products, and you're missing this opportunity. Maybe they got to get you. You know, we got to get some corporate sponsorships going because not enough people know about Glenn Villapu. They know about the students of your students of your students, but they yeah. don't know. They don't know Big Daddy. I got you know, people ask me, "Well, what famous people study with?" I don't. I have never bothered to keep a track. <laughs> Richard McDonald, Bruce Drusen, Mark Westermo. The entire Riley method comes through you because you taught Mark, and then Mark and also Fred taught Mark. But like all of the popular YouTubers, Proco, 
Proko uh, did a did a thing on your on your book for the for the New Masters Academy Vilku drawing manual that you can get from New Masters Academy. You can get signed copies of that. It's, we republished it. Proko said that he used your book more than any other resource to develop his figure training. That's millions of views. Proko is mainstream, millions of views. He went to Watts Atelier. He didn't say that he used the Riley method as the primary source. He uses Vilpu. Marco uh, Bucci or Buki, um, so many of these 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 uh, popular artists today who are on YouTube are Vilpu students, and so or Vilpu students of Vilpu uh, students of students of yours. Not to mention a lot of the, the leading artists of of today. Everybody has come in contact with your work in one way or another. So when they ask what famous students studied with you, I'll tell students. Glenn changed the face of art on the planet Earth. It's like, it, that's a ridiculous question because of the, because listen, you taught the Disney artists how to draw. So you taught the Disney Renaissance artists how to draw. So you're teaching Danny Galeotti, and then he goes and he's animating the lions and Lion King and he's animating Hercules and Hercules and he's doing, so you taught these artists who formed our childhood. And so you're inside our brains without us even realizing it. Like, that's the thing is like, when you get to the level of Glenn Vilpu, where it's a lifetime award-winning, Annie-winning artist, like your, your your influence is impossible to quantify. It's impossible to quantify. Uh, it's almost a stupid question yeah. to ask who you taught. But I'm a realist. I look at the guys and I say, okay, uh, People say you're, you're so good and all that, but then I break, dig out my pantormo. Yeah. <laughs> my that'll, that'll humble you real quick. And I said, okay, you know, yeah. a little bit of reality doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. Do Do you think? Because look, um, I know that we we we're partnered with Drawbox, and and that's a community that we support. It's a free check it out. Drawbox.com, amazing free uh, art education resource. Um, and one of the things that comes from the Drawbox community is the students will say, don't compare. And I, I think I think Urshad did a video on this, don't compare. And I think the idea there was don't compare yourself to other artists because you'll just get into a negative headspace and you won't be able to create. And I, I understand where that's coming from and I agree. But at the same time, I also feel like what you just said is compare. You just said, take a Vilpu and take a Rubens and it's only when you put those next to each other can you really kind of see where you have room to grow? It's only by comparison with the masters then we can even understand where we are. How do you feel about that idea of compare or don't compare? I, it's not comparing in the sense is that, I, okay, the first artist book I ever bought was on uh, Hokusai. Me too, actually. I'm still buying, I just came back from Japan a couple of weeks ago and I went to the Hokusai Museum. Yeah, and I, I, was, and I, I had a bunch of Japanese students, and I was giving them a hard time because they had never been to the Hokusai Museum. <laughs> and so, <laughs> taking taking students in Tokyo to taking and, and That's haranguing wild. them, and haranguing them because they hadn't been to the Hokusai Museum. <laughs> That's cra That's crazy that you're teaching them their own <laughs> their own culture, but. I have a collection of uh, of Hokusai's, the original drawing manuals, and then we photograph those, Glenn, and we put them on New Masters Academy in super high res. So a lot of the New Masters students are learning from Hokusai because they're because we're we're buying these and they're part of the rare book collection, and then we're putting them online. And so I think that's a really fantastic point too that you're you're also talking about an Asian master. Um, rather than an old like an old like we're not talking about uh like the renaissance for example do you how do you feel about that like which periods of art have been the most useful for you to study or do you learn from any period of and art that you study i, I like i just said i was <clears throat> preparing a lecture on uh where i'm talking about thomas art benton who died in 1975 yeah and i'm the thoughts in how you take and do it like an organic composition. Well, we got Tintoretto. We got the El Greco studied with Tintoretto. And we find that Cezanne was influenced by El Greco. And you go all the whole through and it's a constant. There's this, you will look at it differently. Yeah. In other words, no matter who you're looking at, it, you're seeing it through your eyes and through your period. 
and yeah. you will see something different. Yeah. And so people say, well, I'm a Renaissance drawing. Well, now I'm not a Renaissance drawer. I yeah. draw that has a certain look because that was I was interested in it. But it's still it's different. Yeah. And it will be different. And you can't you people say, oh, I'm gonna draw like Phil Poo. Yeah. Well, okay, you better be able to take and put in and do what I did to do that. That's yeah. Different. Yeah. Yeah. They can draw, yeah, or they can draw like the best version of themselves and they can take the things that resonate the most from Vilpu. And I think that's more what New Masters Academy is about. It's about mm -hmm. finding the kinds of living masters and masters of the past that resonate with you, taking the things you love about those things and then doing your own, creating your own style with it. We don't teach one style, you know, I think that's important. You can't, in a way, people all ask as well, how do I develop my own thing? Well, you can't help, but you, 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 not, you can't undo it. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. you're gonna be you're gonna be you. Yeah. And the the the, the parts that I don't like uh, often when people are you when you look at an art, the thing that I look for is it is it honest. Mm. Is it just is it or is this is this something like a hotel painting that's sort of a a manufactured thing that there's no soul in it? What's the, what's the difference? How how do we know if we're making soulless art or honest art? Like maybe somebody's having doubts about themselves. Like I don't even I don't know. Is it honest? What well, do you we all have doubts about ourselves. <laughs> you you don't have to be an artist to have doubts about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everybody that's that's just normal yeah and you you just that you it's by experience you look at things and you look at things and you look at things and you can sometimes once you get really sensitive to it you can take and see the difference yeah and people say well what what is that difference come on yeah. What's the difference between who can explain the difference between a cherry pie made by? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and not for you sure. Know, you know the difference, but Possibly. yeah, yeah. It, it's um, that's one thing that look. There's some things I take for granted in the art world because you were, you were not only my most influential mentor and teacher, but you also were one of my first art teachers because. The art system in the United States has been defunded. So I didn't really get art classes and neither did Caleb. And I don't know how it was for Peter, but I'm guessing it was similarly rough getting a, a good art education. So when I when I started studying with you, I had studied a, a very little bit, very, very briefly with Michael Mentler and I, I did a few other things. But when I started studying with you like seriously, um, the amount of the way you approach art I just sort of inherited that without even realizing it. Like we draw all the time. We're always trying to draw at a hundred percent of our focus. We're never just doodling or scribbling. We're always drawing at our best. We're always studying from the past and studying from nature. You know what I mean? It was, it was like being educated by like Leonardo da Vinci or something where it's this <laughs> idealistic romantic lifestyle that you live. And for you, you know, your, your life has been so public for so long because you've been a public figure for, I'm guessing most of your life, people have known who you are. You haven't been an anonymous person for the vast majority of your, of your lifespan. And so I wonder, what is it like, what is it like living such a public life where you are influencing so many artists all the time and you know, you don't have as much privacy. Like, are you just completely used to it? Do you like it? Do you not like it? I'm curious about that. It, it's a, uh, how can I put it? <clears throat> in, in a sense, I, yes, I've been teaching for, forever, okay? And I'm in class, I'm exposed, I'm doing it, okay? But it's been a, uh, a, a I think it's a, I don't know how to put this. I am myself, I am me, and I have confidence in myself. Mm -hmm. Were you always were you always confident? No, <laughs> but it's the idea is that uh, when you when you it's you and it's it's a philosophical uh, thing is that 
what I do is it's me. And if you don't take it from maybe me, I make mistakes. I, one of the things I've done as a, as a teacher is I don't try to do to hide when I make a mistake. When I make a mistake, it's something for the teacher that is learning. I learned that from you too, Glenn. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah, a lot of teachers, they won't, they'll do everything they can to hide their mistakes. And there's been people, famous people, I'm not gonna name names, famous people that we almost did a course with, but we couldn't make it work because they wanted to have editorial control over mistakes in an unreasonable way. Famous artists where they they don't want to show that they make mistakes. And one thing I learned from you is that watching, and also Kim Jong-gi, for example, watching how the mistakes get integrated into the another master of sketching that we lost. And I actually introduced you to Kim Jong-gi. Do you remember that? At a, yeah. And, I, I take in, well, we've, uh, you know, okay, I do my Vilpu Academy and you do the new masters now, but we have a thing that you do everything visually perfect. All the pecky stuff is absolute. I do things sort of well. There might be there might be a cat there might be a cat in the room. There might be a cat or a naked toddler running by the room. <laughs> and uh, taking and uh, I my attitude has been hey. Yeah. It's the message that gets across that's the important part. Yeah. And it's the drawing. We, yeah, it, it's the drawing. And you know, so I, the, it's not perfectly good. Everything's yeah, not yeah. perfect. It's, it, and I make mistakes. I learned. I yeah. The evolution of my drawing is a big change, but a lot of it has to do with the need to communicate. Do you do you hear from because I hear this a lot from students that they're afraid to show their work because they're thinking that when they get better, that old work is going to drag them down or hurt them in some way. Do you have advice for people who are afraid of like sharing their work publicly or just to others because of that insecurity that they're going to later regret it? What advice do you have for for somebody like that? Well, most of the time, the student doesn't really see his work very clearly. They don't. Uh, <clears throat> they don't have a, a real conception yeah. of what their work looks like. They think it's bad because they were not good, because they had a conception in their mind and it doesn't quite match that conception. They have a delusion, in other words. Yeah, they have well, a lie that they believe. Yeah, and and, and also that, that, that in a, in a way, the student really doesn't know what a good drawing is. Yeah, is that is that the job of the teacher to not only show what a good drawing is with our drawings that are hopefully masterful, but also say, look at these masters. Is that our responsibility so that they're like, oh, that's what a good drawing looks like? Is that is do you see that yeah, as important? Also. I was uh, drawing it uh, during when we were in New Mexico. I brought up the thing that uh, Raphael kept drawing the ankle bones wrong. That's so funny. <laughs> I love I love that you I love that you found that. That's well, hilarious. Since then, I since then I I took and I started looking a little bit more. I said, well, maybe this was an accident. You oh. know, just, consistently. <laughs> he was consistently doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah. but we we all have that you know there's some error where i was putting the head of the humerus not in the right place or i was putting the cheekbone we all have these things that when we learn them we're like oh god i wish i could go back in time and like edit it. <laughs> well it's it's like i know i tend to make the forearm too long i know yeah. that yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'm constantly correcting myself, and I yeah. okay, I make the legs a little long, but I like the look. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If you know what you're doing and why, I, but I think with students and with all of us, a lot of our mistakes we don't know we're making these mistakes, and it takes another artist to be like, oh, you know, you make your shoulders really boxy, but then you don't make them round after that, so they kind of stay boxy and they contrast with the torso, and you're like, holy crap, I am doing that, you well, know. <laughs> well, uh, there's one question that um, 
uh, the students never ask. What's and that? I brought this up several times. And it was a question that came up when I was a student. The instructor leaning over your drawing, and you're sitting and working from the model, and he says, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, you, you're, I'm drawing the model, you know. No, you know, you know. But what are you doing at this moment? Yeah, what's the point? What, yeah. what are you? What are you? What are you? Where's your focus? What yeah, are you yeah, yeah. Publish, and <laughs> that the students they are doing a drawing yeah. without really thinking about why what are, what are they trying to do with this yeah. trial yeah and so that becomes a middle uh thing and that's what i keep saying drawing is thinking it is thinking and it's also a form of meditation yeah is that you're so focused on the thing that you're doing and it's the <laughs> damn fun do you do you, do you think that the because i was thinking about this myself because uh I don't, uh, I don't drink or do anything wild anymore in terms of substances or anything, but I do notice a little bit of a, maybe this is getting too spicy, but I do notice that when like I draw and I fully, or if I'm sculpting or modeling or doing any, doing anything with a, with, but when I'm totally focused and I like lose time, there's something like going on in my brain that like, it, like I need to do that. Otherwise I start getting very anxious or I can get whatever and so i'm wondering like is there an addictive quality to like drawing you think like like where your brain not that it's not healthy but is there some do you think it's addictive that that focus that that feeling what do you think well i really i really think it is uh, just like the, uh, like truly like meditation it is because it's a single-mindedness yeah and that at that state when you i would sort of use the joke about when you're in class the students when you know when we were teaching at the animation guild we would in class and we'd be lecturing and we'd going around and you know, going over people's drawings and people are oh damn they're having a hard time they walk out of the room smiling yeah yeah they they complain like oh it's torture oh the glenn's doing this but then they're but they're so happy at the same time that is interesting yeah, yeah. And, and i i really think it is because i have done a, a fair amount of meditation self-hypnosis mm -hmm. uh and I, I it's a way it's a way of taking in and focusing and it, like it, it, it challenges yeah it really yeah uh, <laughs> And I, I you know a lot of people take and listen to all kinds of music and, and chatting and stuff. And I try, I over the years, I've gotten away. Well, with my hearing, it doesn't make it. But anyway. I mean, I, you're, you're, you're hearing, it's a miracle that we can have this. Talk about technology. It's a miracle we can speak right now the way we're speaking. I know, right now. That, that this is this cochlear implant. Yeah. You know. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. No, well, well, you know, in class when you were first started studying with me, that uh, people were having to write down questions. Uh, well, people would ask me to ask questions sometimes because my, I've got a very large rib cage and very big lungs, and so I have a very loud voice. So people would be like, "Joshua, will you ask Glenn this? Joshua, will you ask Glenn that?" So I could just be like, "Hey, Glenn," <laughs> and you'd be like, "Yeah," and then you could hear me fine. Yeah. yeah. So. It's been it's been uh, actually uh, pretty much of a miracle, but uh, did, did your I don't know if this is too personal, but when you suffered hearing loss before you were able to get the implants, obviously much later, did that help you focus on your craft? Because it was almost like when you're trying to sleep and you put a face mask on or you do earplugs so you can sleep. Is a little bit like that where you were sort of like able to focus. Or were you find it distracting, like oh, what's going on around me, kind of a thing? Yeah, no, I uh, it really did, did make a difference. I think. Uh, well, I think there are certain uh, things that uh, happened in my life. Okay, first, I didn't learn English until I started school, so I never really. And I'm also, I didn't realize it until much later that I am dyslexic, mm. okay? So I sort of like, I could very easily, I just shoved the world aside. Yeah. 
the drawing and the painting yeah. was uh, that was my area. I could take and I that's what I did, <clears throat> and that's how I was able to take and uh, go forward. I think that, that not being able to speak English to start with, yeah, was one was alienating. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it. I was already uh, separate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my my father didn't speak English when he was a, a child in the United States, and uh, he was punished for it. Uh, his teachers made him sit in the closet and throughout the whole classroom because he didn't speak English, and it actually like traumatized him terribly. So I don't know. I know he's coming from a different part of the world. I don't know. Did you ever experience prejudice because you didn't speak English, like people made fun of you or you weren't able to get along with people or was it just like you just couldn't make friends because you couldn't communicate? What was your experience like? You know, we, I had a lot of friends and uh, we moved to California <laughs> actually when I was like nine years old. Mm. Okay. So, and I, by, but I had lived in an upper Michigan where I didn't have to speak English when we came back from Finland mm. and uh, had grandparents that spoke Finnish. Well, I have always been very proud to be a fit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people, yeah. uh, I don't know, I tend to ignore. <laughs> my, my sister uh, actually said that, you know, talking, telling Eleanor, my wife, uh, that, well, Glenn was always in a cloud. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't, he didn't, he didn't ever know what was going on at the house. That's and, so funny. I wonder how much of that is uh, convenient because I wish I could just <laughs> be unavailable sometimes. And uh, well, I, I, you know, maybe it's uh, some kind of ego trip or something. I don't know, but I can pretty much ignore stuff. Yeah, it's it's for me. I, I, I always I always noticed that about you, but I feel like to me, I always took it more as a philosophical thing. Like you're you're sort of focusing on what matters, right? And you're not getting caught up with bullshit. And so, because yeah, students I, like I had a good friend of mine who died many years. He's actually a very prominent painter, John L. Toon. And that was one of the things that John said is that this is if Glenn says it's bullshit, it probably <laughs> is. <laughs> uh, you know, I was trying to I was trying to bring up Elisa because one of our best students is also a student of yours, Elisa. She's fantastic, but also she. Uh, uh, she's also from Finland, and I just thought it was funny. But I don't know if you've seen any of her recent work, Glenn, Elisa. But she's been sort of doing some really interesting. Oh yeah, I, I, you know who this is, right? You know Elisa. Yeah, she was, she was, she was in uh, uh, Italy with you. Yeah, but also yeah, she did. Yeah. She did and do that. Yeah. because I was able to. Uh, I still speak enough Finnish that I uh, was able to communicate, <laughs> and pretty she's a pretty talented kid. She's a Beautiful. I don't know if you know this, but she was a competitive figure skater. I found out there's oh, video of her doing like these insane things on the ice, and as soon as I I saw that video, I was like, that makes sense, Elisa, because she brings like a discipline. That's, and she brings. That's it. She respects her teachers. She takes it seriously. And it's just like, whatever, what makes you successful at art is the same thing that makes you successful in life. It's all the same <laughs> skill, right? Now, I, I've always, I've actually studied a lot of philosophy. And I've gone through and I've read everything from uh, the Socrates, all the pre Socratics to Nietzsche and whoever. <clears throat> But I I follow a uh, uh, Roman. Uh, he was actually a slave, uh, Epictetus, first century Roman Greek. This uh, is uh, this is Stoicism, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and that part of the thing is what you work on is yourself. Yeah, and that that's. I don't worry about that big part yeah, Control what you can control. Don't worry about what you can't control. Try to be useful and don't let delusions run your life. That's that's some of what I got from it. I'm not an expert, but. Yeah, you, that's you exactly. Know. That's exactly. And, and I think I sort of came to that naturally. Uh, uh, 
when I first started reading it, it made sense because in a sense, that's what I was already doing. I was sort of like ignoring everybody else. Yeah. And I was never, I was never a follower. Mm -hmm. Well, what about that? That's actually an interesting question because your teachers were such, when you were young, your teachers were like the Glenn Vilpoos in terms of like status. Like, because I'm imagining that people like Harry were like Titans when you were an art student. How did you learn from your teachers without becoming, because I remember you told me once that uh, when I was studying with you that you kind of went your own way pretty early on in your career in terms of what you were following. Um, how did that work? Like, were, were there any teachers that you really studied under for a long time, the way I studied with you? Or was it more like you were more like a butterfly and you were going from one? Yeah, well, you know, uh, Carmine and Fidelson were probably the two main teachers, but I had other people. Yeah. And uh, I was basically just not a follower. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would say, you know, they would, they would begin. And one of the things that was sort of an interesting thing, okay, I didn't get into animation until uh, already uh, 40 years old. I've been exhibiting, wow. been exhibiting for 20 years as a painter. Yeah, it's very rare. Yeah. And so the minute, the minute I, the minute I took and started working in animation, all these friends, the teachers, they said, that's not art. You're off the. You're you're no longer part of us. Damn, it's like that. Yeah, just like that. And so it's you're being divorced in a way. But it, to me, I it was sort of like tough. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and whoever these people are, they're not as well known as Vilpu. I can tell you, you that. Know, if you if you don't have uh, faith in me, you're out of my picture. Yeah. Do you think, do you think that, because I think things have changed a lot when it comes to like entertainment art being taken more seriously and, and narrative arts and, and, and comics arts and they're in museums and there's, do you think that's changed now or do you think there still is a prejudice that if you're doing something for entertainment, it's somehow lower than fine art or gallery art or conceptual art or whatever the postmodernist things going on? What do you think about that? Do you well, think that changed? The most, uh, influential art today is animation. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely the most influential. Yeah. Okay. And so that that uh, if you want to take and be in the forefront of something, and you're looking to make a name, mm -hmm. and trying to take and is uh, looking say quote what's the style or what's the technique whatever, animation is number one. But yeah. animation. It's not an individual art. Yeah, I was going to say that animation is unbelievably massive because you, you've you been in leadership roles and Bill Perkins was director of development for Marvel, a uh, uh, new master's instructor and art director. So when you have these huge teams of artists, because I've talked about this and thought about this a little bit, because the old masters would, you know, they would, they would, they were doing more of the design. Whereas with these huge teams in these big projects, like a AAA video game or an animation project, what does that do to the craft and what does it do to the individual artistic minds when it's part of such a huge collaboration? I'm curious what you think about that. How does it change things? Well, I had, like I said, I was 40 when I started in animation. And, but at the time I had no illusions about me taking and taking a leadership role. Mm -hmm. And I had to take and convince people at various times in my career there that I'm not, I don't, I'm not coming in here to take over your job. That mm -hmm. I will do a good job at what I'm, what, what I do and what I, where I can put my skills to best. I'll do the best I can do there. But what, I'm was, not, was that your attitude for your whole career in animation or was that your attitude coming into it? Oh, right from the beginning, because the first, the impetus of going into animation was I wanted somebody to give me a paycheck every week. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> yeah, so that was the thing. So, fine, that didn't stop me from doing it. It allowed me, that's why, like, even as a teacher, 
you do your best you possibly can, but it allows you also at the same time to do what you want to do on the other side or whatever. Yeah. If you can combine, if you can combine the two things together, your own personal expression, but you have to be realistic that if you're going into animation, it is a collaborative business. And that was one of the first things that when I started working at Disney, they said, well, they've had a lot of really good artists come oh, in yeah. who, who, who could not function there because they could not take and give up. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, I've heard a lot of that from my friends who were uh, worked in that field. And another thing I'm 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 curious about, how is it that you were able to be one of the most influential figures in animation without being particularly interested in animation? Like that's really because I think of Ilya, who is now at uh Zaum uh, Z A U M, he's the the company that Disco Elysium. And I don't think Ilya and I ever talked about video games in all of our conversations, and we're close friends. And now he's a lead character artist for one of the boutique most respected. And I'm just thinking like. How is it that that's possible? And what does that say about the industry? Well, well I'm trying to be spicy. I'm just wondering what you think. Okay. What, what I had that they didn't have particularly was a very clear cut approach to taking and communicating the drawing. Okay, people were talented. You had lots of really talented people doing it. One husband, Mike Sedino, Glenn Keane, yeah, all these guys. Yeah, but all, all they, they they were really they were really good. Okay, what I was able to do was to show a skills, drawing skills that transcended a particular style or technique or what have you. Because every film is done differently. Yeah. And but this, the the mechanics, the tools that they don't change. Drawing is drawing. Yeah. And, and to be able to take and and communicate an approach to drawing, where you're able to take and at the same time, show your own personal uh, personality. Now the, the idea, to me now, is that in drawing, drawing is that you're taking and communicating a feeling and an expression. Okay, that transcends a particular style. Yeah. A different technique. Okay, but though all of those things are put to the purpose of taking and communicating, and that's like you know, we're going to talk about the stone paper. Mm -hmm. Well, I find that. That has changed the technique that I do a lot of using a, a water soluble crayon, water brush, and being able to be more expressive, but still using the same basic fundamental things that communicate. But the point of it is is the expression yeah. that you're creating. But that, that's really interesting because in a postmodern context, often the concept or the expression is untethered from craft. So this is me. This is me being expressive here. Yeah. <laughs> so how is that not what you're talking about? Because I think that you can only be expressive through craft. That's sort of the way I frame it. But I'm curious how you how you think about that. It's it's the. Um, uh, I, I give you a pencil to draw, <laughs> but the idea. The idea is that it's a very finite stuff. I, I give an example a lot of times in class. I had a pianist friend who was concertizing, and she offered me to sit in a master's class. And these are all professionals all concertizing all over the world. And I sat in there, and they had two pianos. And the student would get up there, hardly a student professional, would, would start playing, and the teacher would say, Beautiful. Okay, but now let's start with the first note. How do you go from this to uh, it's that subtlety of the subtlety the, of the relationship of forms and lines that take and create the art that creates the feeling, and so it's constantly taking and trying to see what that's what is it that that's making that 
thing. How do you make the eye move to take this experience and make so, it? So like the basics and the most simple elements are the ones that are most important. Is that, am I understanding you right? Absolutely. Absolutely. In, in other words, there's a lot of great artists that weren't particularly great draftsmen. Okay, uh, when we think of a Cezanne, Cezanne was sort of, you know, or William Blake, of, not, not that great of a draftsman. Uh, and even uh, we think of it, uh, Nicholas Poussin. Yeah, he came to, to rather late in life. Mm -hmm. I think he was rather he wasn't a, a child genius by any means. Mm -hmm. And, and his, you don't look at Poussin for the to sit for the really extraordinary kind of draftsmanship that we look at Michelangelo, but fantastic. His paintings are unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was, uh, I was teaching and I, uh, a student was doing sergeant studies and they were asking how to like construct them. And I was just demonstrating for that student that the sergeant drawings are more optical. And so if you look for the construction, they're beautifully built, they're masterfully built, but the, the construction, the sculptural information is not there always. And so I was showing that in the shadow side of the face, the eye had drifted down, like the eye was in the wrong place. And I was saying it's because he's going fast and because it's in shadow, but that's not really like the old masters. The old masters were really like, they would have really defined that really beautifully and carefully. So how do you think about that when it comes to like artists who are clearly masters, but maybe they're not masters in the fundamentals that you're emphasizing. How do you, would you, would you pick them as an example and point out what you think is not working and what's working? Or do you just try to only pick the example that you want to make your point as a teacher? I mean, because if you notice a problem and your students are like, you're saying mm -hmm. this, but this artist is doing that. And then you're like, yeah, this is how, what this artist is doing isn't working. Do you ever get into that? It seems like it's a little bit like controversial to say yeah. anything negative about Sargent, for yeah, example. Yeah, I, you know, I use examples of artists that are people say, well, where did that come from? <laughs> how can you how can you look at a Picasso and yeah. think of that as great art? How can you know the the and I think I use uh, uh, right uh, I use a lot of time for drawing of people say, but this isn't Michelangelo. I use uh, Adolf Menzel. Menzel, yeah. And it's a different kind of feeling, but God, he, you try to do that, you're going to be, you know, there's a, there's a feeling and there's a quality that you get the, out of that drawing that uh, transcends whether it's, you know, well, he, he, he you know, maybe I shouldn't, he was really, uh, an, Degas, you know, you actually copied uh, paintings by Mansell. Yeah. And people say, well, why if you look at Degas drawings and I feel and there's a, a sketchbook of uh, some of his drawings, his sketchbook stuff, they're not great drawings. <laughs> yeah. Or you look at Lautrec, they're not great drawings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they, but they are, but they aren't. There's there is yeah, but there is something that there's yeah. something that is there. And so yeah. so you're not you're not a purist where it's like every fundamental needs to be cranked to 10. Oh, you can appreciate yeah. art for on its own terms based on what they are doing beautifully. Like Monet, maybe you're looking at how he's using hue to create a sense of a scene. Yeah. Whereas, so that, that's kind of how you you approach it. I, you know, people say, well, well, okay, use Picasso. And they say, well, look at this Picasso. What do you think of that? And I said, yeah, that's the best. Picasso does the best Picassos I've ever seen. You know, and he is, that's who he is. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's what he is, and you don't try to take and turn an apple into an orange. Yeah, that's, I'm not yeah. sure I can follow you that far down the rabbit hole when it comes to Picasso. Yeah. but I get, I get the yeah. intention. <laughs> appreciate the appreciate the uh, the artist for what he is. Yeah, because at the end of the day, if the art is bad, it doesn't matter. Whereas if there's one thing that's useful. Then you've you're a better artist for getting that one thing. I I, I think that I think that's a very stoic <laughs> kind of a way to think about it. In a way, it's practical. It's like okay, 
I'm not going to look at it for the things that aren't strong. I'm going to look at it for what, maybe it's just one thing. Maybe it's just one thing I'm getting out of it, right? Absolutely. And that's the whole thing with the big part of the, the hepatitis is you be, if you are happy with what you have, yeah. hey, yeah, you know, no yeah. matter what, what, no matter what comes to you, yeah, don't be thirsty. I, I, got, I, I, I got what I want. I yeah. got, I, I don't need anything else. Yeah. And people say I have to have so much money, or I have to have this. No, you don't. Yeah. yeah. I, I, we, we can look at our, uh, our erstwhile friend running for president. He's got the quote all this money and everything and all, uh, and. It's, well, yeah, it, it, they're enormous amounts, but those are uh, those are inverted. Those what, are... The farther they go up, the farther they fall. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I'll I'll avoid that. I'll avoid that <laughs> landmark. Well, Guys, how are we do, how are we doing on time? I don't get. It. I look at politics as a form of entertainment. Oh, jeez. I don't. Yeah. I don't get involved in it. I'm not a. Uh, well, I won't go into my politics. I yeah, Caleb and I, Caleb and I used to work in politics. I know you remember that, and so it it is. It has been nicer to, as I get older, be more selective with what I allow my brain to worry about and focus on if if it's not productive. Which again, it comes back to the stoicism thing: is what I'm doing impactful, or am I just being unhappy because I, all of the injustice of the world and what's going on overseas and genocide and and organ harvesting in China and genocide in Gaza and uh, I think Caleb's telling me to <laughs> but you know what I mean like you could you could you could waste your life Absolutely. worrying about that right and then, then then what good are you going to do you know and and uh, and yeah, I don't want to get political on it, but I do think that like we we do want to focus on that's what I love about art is that's creative, it's an act of love. We're not destroying something, we're not taking something away, we're building. And I'm happy living a life where that impact is making people's lives better. As, as long as I'm useful. Yeah. That's 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 what counts. Yeah. To do things. Uh... Hey, Caleb, you're muted, but you're talking, I can say. What? Caleb is talking, but we can't hear him. Yeah, I think uh, C Caleb might have a, a thing with his microphone. Uh, but just while we're here, uh, we yeah. are at uh, we're at ten fifteen. Uh, we've gone about an hour and fifteen minutes. Our next event isn't until oh another forty five minutes away. So this is a really exciting conversation. Feel free to oh we have more time. This. You have more time, so if, oh, okay. if, you, if if you're both free with your schedule, oh, okay. feel free to I didn't get to any of these questions. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. I think it's it's been a wonderful conversation so yeah. far. Caleb, if you're talking to us, we can't actually hear you. But how about this? Uh, let me refill my coffee for one second. So give me two minutes. Why don't we take a two-minute break, and then we'll do part two. Does that sound good for everybody? Just a little bathroom break, whatever you guys got to do. Two minutes. No, we can't hear you, dude. Two minutes, okay. then we'll be right back. No problem. More coffee. Be right back. No problem. <laughs> Let me put up a little. Uh... Am I uh, still on here? You're, you're still on, Glenn. You can go ahead and switch your okay, camera off. Yeah. Like... yeah, I think, you know, between Joshua and Caleb uh, have done an amazing job, actually. And the service that they've created with the new masters is uh, pretty phenomenal. Uh, so they've they, they've really done a, a, an amazing job with this, and I I feel like uh, these guys have become like uh, some of my children. <laughs> the way I look at it, you know, it's like uh, these are the extended family, and. Uh, as an extended family, you always you do your thing, and you're just so happy when your family takes and does their thing. 
and just moving on and uh, hopefully uh, you've given a good example of what to take and to do and how to be and of course they're going to do it differently uh, they will take and try to undo the mistakes that i have uh, and improve and that's what exactly what they're doing and i can't uh, just just like a my kids, I, I, I can only be happy to see to how they've developed and how they're doing and what, what's going on. And, and I'm treating this, as, 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 that's the way I see it. And uh, so many of the students, they're doing their own thing, which is great. And they using the stuff that I, and I've given them an example, uh, not great all the time, but hopefully they've gotten a lot of use out of it and keep improving. And next generation and uh, the obligations that they have uh, to keep it honest, do the best you can. You know, there's, there's, there's no rules. <laughs> and that, that, it's for life. It's just life. And it's so much when, uh, he says all the nice things when I'm away from the camera. I can barely hear from the other room. But Glenn, speaking of like carrying it forward, carrying the art forward, because again, I know it's tiresome to keep bringing up AI, but it's a bit of like a cultural crisis, a financial crisis. I'm sure you know a lot of people in entertainment who have been laid off from the major studios. I'm looking at all the major studios, basically the big tech companies, and you know uh, Marvel, Disney, you know they've made all these layoffs and in, in the games industry and what i'm hearing from a lot of colleagues is that what they're doing is they're essentially instead of having artists train kind of like you did where you're going from layout or whatever and you're working your way to wherever you're going that's sort of stopping and what they're doing now is they are using the people at the senior level to work with technology ai and train their own AI and basically they're replacing the junior level artists and even senior level people with technology. Like literally like the tool is now taking the place of the artist. And I don't know how fall, how closely you follow this. Yeah, uh, I, I do try to keep up with pretty much a lot of the stuff. And my, ex, my experience, my experience is that uh, the taste of the audience will be constantly changing, and that even with all of the uh, technology, like in the animation, that people actually prefer the uh, simple drawn imagery and what maybe, and it, the technology is really good at giving you shapes, the things, and what have you. But in the end, it's uh, why we use those in the animation. It's, it's story, story, story. And right. no matter if an AI can take and make these stories, but if the essence of, of the thing is not there, and that's the individual that creates it, that's going to make the difference again between a piano player and a pianist, you know, and uh, the pianist will win out. So you you are a believer and a proponent, and frankly, we're both investors in this idea of human craft, that it's not about getting the image from somewhere. It's about what goes into creating it. Is that fair to say? Like, it's yeah, the human yeah. element that matters. Is that how you feel about it? Well, that's, again, the definition of art. It's the expression of man. Well, if that's the case, then AI artists, that that's so that's even that is has some controversy there because AI people who use AI to generate images, which I think is just mass plagiarism of real art, but they they want to be taken seriously as artists, even though they are not. It's like Rick Rubin. <laughs> right. Do you see that well, interview with Rick, <laughs> with Rick Rubin where it's like, hold on, do you understand how to use any of this technology? And he goes, No. It's like, do you know how to play any instruments? And he goes, No. And he's like, so why are you getting paid all this money? And then he goes, and he closes his eyes, and he goes, 
it's a belief and a feeling in my, but it's like this idea that it's the idea. I think the I think modernism, postmodernism, and traditional art, they're that tension between expressiveness or concept and craft, right? There's that tension. I think that in a way, artificial intelligence is making that even more pointed because if it really is the intent and the concept, the way that the the way that the postmodernist conceptual <laughs> artist believes it is, then why can't you have the computer do the work? It's not about the craft. But if it's the way I think, which is that craft is the way in which you express yourself and it's a human activity, then the AI can't do it. So I think these questions, which were maybe a little more philosophical in the past, are becoming like extremely relevant because what is art? And if the computer is not making art without a person, what is its value? And should we be valuing the artwork or should we be valuing the time of the creator? Like, how do we make sense of all of this in okay. the future? <laughs> okay. At 87, I've gone through a few cycles. <laughs> okay. And I, is when I first started, literally when I was teaching at Art Center, I quit because at that point, we're talking in the 1974, they were saying, you don't need to draw anymore. You don't need to draw. That, that's out. And in fact, when I was in high school, I already had a teacher who was saying, you don't need to do that anymore. You, you know how to do that. Well, obviously, I, I didn't think I did. And at that point, I... When I started my own school in, in 1974, 74. What was it? What was the school called? Was it like Vilpu? Just the Vilpu Studio. Vilpu yeah. Studio. Wow. Yeah, and I was teaching everything, doing everything myself. Okay, but the point the point was that I was taking and reacting against the trend of going into total abstraction and total conceptual type of work. And I didn't feel, to me, that's not, again, it was personal. That's not what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take, and I wanted to draw. Yeah. And to get as good as I possibly could at drawing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Animation allowed me to take and continue to pursue that and uh, taking and teaching and drawing. Because the best way to learn something is to try to explain it to somebody else. And that, uh, that has been a, uh, one of the keys of my development. Like I teach quite differently now than I did when I started mm -hmm. and the evolution. But why, why the change? Why the thing? And it had all to do with how you take and can express how like okay, how I do a gesture drawing. Well, it's a combination of composition and aesthetics of how you make the eye move. Well, then that applies into anatomy. Okay, I went away from this blocked blocking the figure in to taking and understanding the anatomy itself because that allowed you to draw from imagination and to go from there so that I could take and draw without any kind of hindrance of anything. I could draw anything in any direction I want from imagination. Yeah, I was uh, I was uh, talking to my students recently about optical methods versus constructive methods because that comes up a lot at New Masters because we teach both. And one thing I noticed from a geometrical perspective is that if you are blocking it in with a bunch of angles more optically, if one of those angles aren't going to be correct, right? Because we're not perfectly accurate. So if they're not extremely accurate, if they're like five percent off, it actually it's actually catastrophic for the drawing. Yeah. because it's going across all the bones and everything. And so if you draw my body and you accidentally get that angle wrong, I'm like a amputee now. Whereas if you're constructing and maybe I have the shoulder like you do, you change it all the time, maybe that shoulder is higher. As long as it has to do with these distances within the body that matter. And so I, I think that there's also like, 
at least for me lately, especially, I've been very interested in geometry because I feel like a lot of the root of the fundamentals is a geometric root, like Euclidean Pythagorean geometry. And I wonder, um, I wonder about how much, I wonder about how much of this stuff really is subjective sometimes because you do gesture a certain way. Another teacher like Mike Matessi, for example, or Steve Houston, they'll teach gesture in a different way. But to me, the thing that is common between you guys is not only, you know, Leonardo da Vinci and all the old masters where we inherited so much of this, but really what's it's, it's, it's geometry, the geometry of nature. And are those continuities of those curves positioned correctly where it flows and then what you do where you connect one thing to another in a way that isn't necessarily realistic but even that is a even that is an abstraction of something we observe in nature oh, things yeah. grow and things move but now you're doing it like thomas hart benton now you're doing it all throughout the picture plane but it's all rooted in geometry isn't it do you think about it like that at all but yeah i don't uh, it, first of all it's it's all abstraction it's not real. Mm -hmm. I mean, people tend to think of you doing realistic drawing that it's real. It's not real. It's a flat piece of paper you take and you're arranging shapes and lines and tones to create uh, that Illusion. thing. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I've been recently, I've been talking about people ask this uh, thing, thing, okay, rhythm. Well, it's also arabesque. Well, where does arabesque come from? Arabic. It's a term. It's Arabic. It's pattern yep. that unites the thing. Yep. And so that rhythm and arabesque are both taking and creating a unifying quality. It's like the beat in music is a rhythm. It carries you through the music. It's not the it's not the melody it's the thing that ties the thing together and we can only we can only experience one note of music at a time so it exists in time but in a way that drawings are like that too because we can't take the entire thing in at once i have to look at the face then i look at the hand then i look at the so in a way in a way i think there is also like a time element in how, oh, that, how you make the art but how you experience it don't you think yeah, I, in fact, I suggest students to, as they're doing a drawing, a gesture drawing to begin with, is that they think of they are actually animating the lines that are going through the figure. It creates a sense of the movement. It is a, how do you lead to your thing? You're not babbling. And That's really interesting. That's really interesting because also what we know about space time is that they are it is the same entity right so what looks like curvature in one way of looking at it is a time dimension with another way of looking at it so maybe movement and gesture and rhythm and curvature and time and narrative it's all really just aspects of the uni same universal literally the universe that we're just accessing in different ways and then we're using it creatively like we're cooking gumbo and we're putting a little spice and we're putting a little of this but you said you said it you were talking about how in a way the drawing's not real it's an illusion right like gombrecht writes about it art is an illusion but it which i agree with obviously but in another way when i it's also it's also but that language of nature is real so the idea of rhythm and the idea that we do get that from the universe and so in a way it, the artist is taking like a truer deeper reality and applying it more to an incidental situation so that we're kind of like mixing layers of reality creatively yeah it's called expression yeah yeah it really that's true it, 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 these are all the different things you can use whether we're talking about uh, okay caption or gesture or you're organizing something it doesn't make any difference if it's a line or a texture or a color. It's how you take and make these things work and relate to each other. Like a lot of my work that I'm doing right now are really quite abstract, but they're yeah. figurative. Yeah. Do you have anything that you want to show on camera right now? Like something you've been working uh, on, maybe? I hate 
Yeah, I can't. Uh, I'm, I'm doing some rather large drawings now. Yeah, I saw. I remember. Uh, and it, like in a big circular form. I'm actually going to paint them. And uh, a figure is going to feeling for the space and things interrupting. And uh, <laughs> not much I can do with that right now. I have, I have a question. Can you guys finally hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hey, Glenn. I just wanted to ask, this is something that's that's interesting to me and to a lot of students. And during your conversations today, you're talking a lot about always learning, uh, always being a student, always looking ahead, always trying to improve. Um, and I guess the big question is, if we're always learning throughout our whole life and we're always trying to get better, when is my art worth sharing? When when can I actually show my stuff? Because if I'm starting now that I'm 36 years old, do I have to, is it 10 years from now that I can have something in front of Vilpu, you know, or do I have to wait until I'm a hundred? Like, how do we, how do we navigate that? Put it out there. <laughs> I was just thinking of Michael Jordan on your hat. It's like, yeah, yeah, get in there. Yeah, yeah, just, just put it out there. Uh, you don't wait because you, you don't really have a conception of what it is you're doing. And, and you, your audience will see it quite differently. Uh, and the, the, a lot of times the thing that you think is like, oh, that's not very good. I, I've had the experience and I know other artists have had the same. Is they've had people buying stuff of theirs that they put stuff i had put some stuff out once i remember and like somebody wanted to buy a piece and i put these things down they picked the thing that i thought was the worst thing i did <laughs> yeah but that they loved it yeah okay that's, so, that's that's an interesting subject glenn like what is art to art something different from what the creator makes it as the viewer Receive. Yeah, viewer, is they, one more legitimate than the other or is it it's all this hallucination we're, we're each having and we think we're communicating but you know what i mean yeah mm -hmm. everybody everybody has their own uh, desires and they, they they're reading into a picture and they they read they read yeah. into the thing yeah. And it means something different than what you intend. And so I used to, and I still do, I do paintings that have, they look like there's some kind of uh, story to this thing. And people are, it's, it's, you might say I'm a symbolist or something, but I don't have anything in mind like that. I'm taking in, thinking about how do these things relate and the feeling it creates something and i mean just recently though i have doing things i the subject matter uh is something but i don't know if people will even recognize what it is i'm talking about that that's a that's, that's we had a student recently who uh is one of our strongest students and they were in italy with us and this student was saying that they were kind of getting inside their own head and getting really discouraged because a lot of artists talk about the concept and the meaning behind their work. And they feel like they just don't have anything to say or they feel like something's wrong with them. And I was telling them that the viewer doesn't understand your meaning because they can't read your mind. And they probably don't care about your meaning unless the artwork is compelling anyway. So don't worry so much about that and just focus on the craft. That was my advice. Would you have different advice for that student? No, people are, I get the same question. What do I paint? I said, paint what you know. Paint, paint what's around you. Paint your family. family. Yeah, paint That's whatever. You turn that make that into your subject. So you okay. don't think it has to have some kind of like postmodernist essay about this is what the piece means, this is what every symbol means, and here's how it's about the you know the war. Uh, Leave that to the writers. <laughs> it's uh, it's not it's a different team, different ball game. Let yeah. let the writers worry about uh, all that. That's funny. Uh, and, and let the artist take and uh, deal with the visuals that he knows. 
Yeah, I was talking about how with some ancient art, for example, or lots of art, we don't even know what it meant. So there's theories of it, but it's yeah. still at the Met, it's still in the Louvre, it's still beautiful, people still get a lot out of it. So it can't just be the meaning of the piece, whatever that means in a contemporary context, because we don't even know the meaning. Or, you know, a lot of like uh, modernist artists would lie about the meaning intentionally, because that was part of the, part of the, uh, there's a film uh, by that Austrian director, what's it called? Oh man, when he deals with that. But basically the idea was that uh, they would intentionally confound, they would confound the audience about what it was and what it meant. And so um, I think maybe people get a little bit too psyched out by that. Whereas I'm not sure it's as important to how the artwork is received and how the artwork is appreciated. It might be important to certain markets or certain, entities but i don't think i think the viewer takes your art as it is and then they feel what they're going to feel and they're going to read into it what they want to read into it but i don't think we have the like i don't think i don't think we have the power to like force people to think about the world in a subjective way we can only we can only have a conversation with them you know we can't yeah, yeah that's uh, uh anyway i Forget about the literary stuff. It, it really doesn't. If you can have fun with it, great. But it's not. It, the writers is a writer's craft. They can do whatever they want with it. What That's it has to do with the painting is something different. Yeah, they don't. I've had critic. I've had gallery people say, "Do not read. Do not read critics. Mm -hmm. And do not." Uh, and I, I've had experiences where I've had a show at a museum, you know, literally a museum show. Yeah. You've had a hundred over a hundred shows, by the way, right, Glenn? How many shows have you been in? How many gallery shows have you been in? Oh uh, well, I stopped showing years ago. But, so uh, many, he got bored with it. That's what it was. Well, it's, it's, it's a pain in the neck. <laughs> I'm not interested. I'm not interested in painting, painting people doing paintings or stuff to put over some rich person's couch. Yeah. You know, I have no, I do it for myself. If people like it, great. If they don't, that's all right. I'm not doing it for them. Yeah. Glenn, when you talk about doing, doing it for yourself, um, so we talked about how the people viewing the art, they're gonna get whatever they're gonna get out of it. But what do we as the artists put into it what are, what are we thinking about when we're creating is the goal accuracy is the goal to to accomplish an image that we have in our head what is it that you're doing when you're creating the art okay it, it that will that will that will have to be an individual thing okay i uh, a bit of a fanatic about drawing so i really like the feeling of, of, of doing something that it's right in the drawing for me Okay, but at the, that that is a, a segment of the thing. It's the overall look of the thing, and is, gee, is that interesting? <laughs> and I like to me the, the like the critical part is that when I was talking about the piano teacher is how you go from one note to the next. And it's the organization of the whole thing that counts. But in that process, I really, as I'm working on the things I right now, I have so much fun with just I want to draw right, and I'm trying to understand it, and I agonize over with the, the twist of a hand, and the guy doing it over and over and over. And I draw it again, and I draw it again, and I draw it again. And then I take and I look at a, 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 some source, and I said, well, why didn't I think of that first? <laughs> well, Glenn, I think you touched on something interesting there. Well, you always do. But um, iteration, right? You worked in animation. The, the animation industry runs on this. But you're also, you're, uh, you've been a painter your entire life, you've sculpted, your, you have family members that sculpted, you've done illustration, you've done so much, but you're probably most famous through your teaching, specifically through um, your drawing and your sketching specifically. So my question for you is this, I know that 
in your personal arts, you iterate your designs, just like Guild Masters, just like everybody. But I think there's a whole new generation of artists, uh, people who are like Peter's age and younger, actually, where I think that because of the internet, um, this is not something that applies to Peter. I'm just trying to give like a context on, on, on people who grew up when there was online art education or it was starting to get big or whatever. Um, but some of these people I noticed, some of these students, they seem to believe that sketching the way you demo, that's what you're always doing. And that I don't think they understand that there's sketching and then which can be your final art, but then there's also this process of like developing something. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because if Glenville, because again, when I think of like masterful sketching artists, I think of you and Kim Jong Gi and many other uh, ma uh, contemporary masters of sketching, but Really, it's like if Glenn comments on this, this is a big deal here. So what's the difference between a sketch and developing something finished, or is there a difference? Well, a sketch, the sketch is, is uh, the moment. It's like a, these drawings I'm just showing a little bit of on the train, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I bring everything to that, but there's no, there's no development in the sketch. I'm taking in most of the development is through many, many years of doing it. But when I'm taking and working on, on say, a, a larger drawing or a painting, I taking and starting out with the concept of something like I, there's a feeling I wanted to get in the thing I'm working on now. There's the figures coming over and there's another figure coming out underneath. So there's a spatial quality in there that I want to get. Now that's not a sketch. I'm having to work like crazy. And I mean, I've done dozens and dozens of thumbnails trying to figure out how to make these figures move the way I want and to take and create a, a feeling uh, of a sort of tension or stress or whatever you want to call it, but within the spatial context. And that I have to work on. I do it again and again and again. And, and it, I put it aside and I come back. And yeah. just, just, like the old, just like the old masters, no difference between what they, the way they were doing that, right? No, well, there's no difference. And, and actually, even those of your interest in animation, Okay, you do story sketches. Well, that's just an idea, and you work like crazy to to communicate through that sketch the thing that is the story point that you're working for. Okay, but that's not the thing. Then that is given to the next guy who takes and develops it and animates it, and you got somebody else who does the background. Yeah. I think they're all this cut. So it's all this pieces that are different people are doing but as an individual artist i take and go through that process i do i do a little sketch oh that's an idea hey that's interesting now where can i do you're, you're the storyboard or artist you're the art director you're the writer you're the Absolutely. cleanup artist you're the inker you're the painter you're the marketer you're the publisher holy crap how does how do artists do that's the job that are baby soft and modern <laughs> selves we do takes it. hundreds yeah. of us to do it. That's where the fun is, actually. It's the figuring it out. It's the composition. It's the how you pull all these things together. And this is also where the frustration is because it, it never seems to be quite what you wanted. And so yeah. you're always trying to take and make it, oh, damn it. And I, I rub it out, and I'll paint over it, I'll put a glaze on it, I'll come back at it. And I moan and I groan, and, and then I put it away, and I come back. Yeah, do, you, Glenn, Glenn, do you have bad days? Do you have a day where you just feel like you can't draw? Does that happen to you at your level? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, uh, what I do is, it's like a candy store. Okay, yeah. if you have too much of a lemon something, well, maybe you need to have a chocolate. <laughs> so I find that working with different materials and stuff, it's uh, like I'm having so much fun with this stone paper and working with the paper and the water and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the other day, I just happened to grab a, a piece of paper that 
What's in stone paper? Oh, hey, this is sort of nice. <laughs> that, that actually, speaking of speaking of keeping it fresh, I don't think I ever asked you this. When did you get out of animation? Animation? When did you leave animation? Not teaching, because obviously you, you still to this day are teaching animators. But when did you stop working in the studios, and why? Because you said you got into it because you needed stability in your life, and you wanted to do your art and and maybe that's how you got into it how'd you get out of it teaching i was i originally quit disney to go back to teaching mm -hmm. i didn't uh, i didn't get fired or get left off or anything i just gave them notice that uh, in four months i was uh quitting yeah and actually i i went into the office and said uh gee I want to take a sabbatical. And they said, yeah. for how long? And I said, well, I want to do this book. Well, how about three years? And they said, well, no, we can't do that. And I said, well, okay. And this was like in September. Heck, they said, okay, come uh, January or you know, end of the year, I'm gonna, I'll, I'm gonna be leaving. Right. And that was great. And yeah. they kept, uh, and so I went back and I went to teaching and I found out that uh, teaching wasn't quite, I had built up too much of a- It was a, romantic when you had when you weren't able to do yeah, it. And then yeah, yeah, I got, you, know, you got a house and you got oh, so many more kids and stuff. And so I did teaching and animation. We'd go back in different studios uh, and- that's what they want anyway. They don't. They don't want you on a healthcare plan. They'd rather just contract everybody. Yeah, anyway, well, right? that, that's, that was a, a big deal because the life, the insurance, the health yeah. insurance that I got through twenty years of working in the industry. But a lot of that, I got my hours teaching because I was teaching at the animation guild. Mm -hmm. So that was a transition. Nice. That makes sense. And that's where I first started studying with you. That's right. Was at the Animation Guild and at your home. But that's interesting because the Animation Guild, if you guys don't know about this, I don't know if we're on good terms with them. I hope we are. But the Animation Guild was, if you guys are in the LA area, it's in Burbank. And you don't have to be an, an like I'm not an animator, but I took so many classes there. And I spent so much time. Mm -hmm. It was really a informative part of my education, and it's something that uh, Carl Ganoss. I don't know, do, Glenn. Do you do you still teach there? Or who who do you know who's teaching there now? The Animation Guild. There's nobody. Oh no. They don't have any classes there. No. Yeah. That's. So that's the really, right? I'm the only thing that's close to that now is down the street is the CTN. There's have some classes and I'm gonna do a few things with them. But they don't the animation guild does not have any classes. God, that's that's tragic. Yeah, they because they've it's become the union has become uh national now. They're it's a big deal. Uh huh. so they've contracted out a lot of training stuff. It's contacted out uh to different people like uh, the uh, what's what I'm trying to think of the other uh, academy in town there. Uh, figure, oh, it is. Uh, yeah, figure the academy. Yeah, they Lofa. they have a group that take and they do some of the training stuff, but it's all online. Yeah, but Lafa, but Lafa doesn't have the same. It, that's that's academic. It's not the same kind no, of. No, but they don't know. They're not. They the same people take and they have had me. Taking oh, weekend yeah. things online and oh, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's cute. I'm just kidding. That's um, awesome, guys. <clears throat> so we're at we're at 152 right now. Uh, Marion, or I'm sorry, that's my time. Marion has her demo or print making demo coming up here in about eight minutes. So I want to make sure that people have time uh, okay. to get over there. Well, um, I, have, I have about eight hours of crits to give you today. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was fun hanging out. Sorry for. Oh no, John! This has been this has been great because I think people understand because uh, we're we've been it's more of a philosophical thing here, and I think that uh, I am you know, obviously I'm so involved with new masters, uh, but I, as I mentioned, I think 
the masters is like one of my kids. Yeah. You well, guys if you, if you want to learn from dad himself, it's vilpooacademy.com. Get the right. Vilpoo manual. Don't buy it on Amazon. That's pirated content. They're stealing they're stealing that house you see and that family and the kids and the whole family. Yeah. If you pirate Glenn's stuff, you're taking money out of their pocket. And so don't buy it on Amazon. The only place to buy the Vilpoo manual, unless you guys are selling it on Vilpoo store, is on New Masters Academy store. You can get our you can get that version of it. But listen, Glenn is not going to be available forever to teach. At some point, he's going to focus on something else and the window is going to be shut. And so I think it's really important while we can to study with the living masters while they're teaching, while it's affordable. Maybe Glenn's profile goes up even more and you just you yeah. can't get into class with him. But right now you can study with him and you can actually get FaceTime with Glenn. You can learn from him directly. And if you're an art collector and you're looking to add something to your collection, it you should uh, be thinking about putting a Vilpu in your collection. Reach out to Glenn, go to Vilpu Academy. This is really, in my opinion, this is the living master of drawing. And not only has he taught me and taught all of us, but he is still remains the king of drawing. Uh, you, nobody gets close um, to Glenn. Thank you. And just keep working because I'm going to try to stay as far ahead of you as I possibly can. <laughs> I know. I just saw that on Friday. I'm, I'm, I'm crushed. Oh, I think I'm good for another 20 years. Yeah, Glenn, Glenn you, you're just amazing. So that you, just so that you guys know, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it, in the chat, thank Glenn, you, everyone's Bella. just been singing thank your God praises. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank you both so much for the wonderful conversation. And please uh, join us, everyone, uh, just in a few minutes for a really exciting uh, demo with a yeah. printmaking demo with Mary Littlejohn. Okay. Marion's amazing. She's going to be she's going to be very famous soon. I can already tell. So again, study with these people while you can, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it, bye -bye. Peter, Caleb. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Time to get to work. Yeah. Okay, take care, Peter. Thank you.